I want to begin with some comments we had earlier today from Pre President Vladimir Putin. He claimed that there's been some progress that's been made in the talks between Ukraine and Russia, saying there are certain positive shifts. Negotiators on your, uh, his side tell him that. What is your response to this? Uh, yesterday, I met with Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, in Antalya. This meeting was facilitated by the Turkish Foreign Minister. We spent an hour and a half, and uh, there was zero progress in talks. So it's hard for me to understand what kind of progress President Putin is referring to. So there, from what your side is saying, there have been no positive movements at all? Well, I see that the Russian army is still in Ukraine. They stay continue destroying our cities, killing our children, civilians. And uh, it speaks for one fact only, that uh, even if uh, we continue talking with Russia, uh, that does not have uh, an impact on uh, the behavior of uh, Russian army on the ground. President Putin also said that talks are happening almost every single day. Is that true? And at, and at what level of the government? No, he, he refers to, uh, the, uh, to the talks taking place between two delegations in, uh, in Belarus. Uh, they do not have take place every day, but uh, it's true that uh, these delegations consist of representatives of parliaments. Um, uh, advisors to uh, presidents and representatives of foreign ministries as well, but this is not the classic, the, these are not the classic uh, diplomatic negotiations uh, as they are usually structured according to, the, to international law. This is the process where countries try to understand each other's expectations, demands, and to breach them. Uh, yes, they are talking, but uh, I couldn't, I cannot say that a lot of progress has been made since they began speaking with each other. Are there any further plans for another meeting between yourself and Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov or even President Putin and President Zelensky? We believe that a personal meeting between President Zelensky and President Putin would be helpful. We all understand that in Russia, President Putin is, is the decision maker and you have to talk to him directly. I remain available for a meeting uh, uh, with Minister Lavrov if he can come with substance in his hands and we can make uh, decisions, we can negotiate and make deals. Uh, but uh, the, the last meeting that we had, we mostly spoke. but. He was not ready to make any decisions, and if, he's, if he changes his uh, approach to, to talks, I'm ready to join. At the beginning, President Putin has said he wanted to, quote his words, demilitarize Ukraine. He also wanted a new government in Ukraine. Did you get the sense from Sergei Lavrov that those are still Russia's lines when it comes to these negotiations? Minister Lavrov mentioned demilitarization once, literally once. He used this word only one time in one hour and a half without going into details. And he said nothing about the change of government in Ukraine. In fact, you know, the Russian position uh, changes uh, all the time depending on the developments on the ground. And since the blitzkrieg or the quick war uh, failed because of the fierce resistance of Ukraine, of the people of Ukraine, they are adjusting their demands to the new reality. But still, uh, if you put all their demands together, they remind more um, uh, an ultimatum of surrender of Ukraine rather than a negotiating position. Your colleague, uh, chief of staff to the president, told my colleague, Maria Tadeo that potentially, or there's lots of signals that Ukraine is ready to talk about neutrality. What does neutrality look like in reality? Well, neutrality doesn't work hand in hand with hard security guarantees for Ukraine. Currently, Ukraine exists in a security vacuum. We are not members of NATO. We do not have any bilateral security uh, guarantee with any country of the world. So the most pressing issue now is to stop the war and to provide Ukraine with necessary security guarantees, like the ones, the one, for example, that if someone attacks Ukraine, then the rest of the countries have to help Ukraine repel the aggression by supplying uh, it with weapons, by fighting on its side, and so forth and so on. 
this is the, this issue stands at the core of the discussion. While everyone tries to focus the discussion on neutrality, Ukraine is actually focused on the issue of security guarantees because the existence of our country depends on whether we are able to solve this problem. But at the moment, there's no movement on getting into NATO. So what does a security guarantee actually look like, say, from the United States or the European Union? Yeah, you're absolutely right. If Ukraine was uh, a member of NATO, uh, we wouldn't have had this, uh, we wouldn't have this uh, situation now, uh, I mean, the war and the Russian aggression. But uh, uh, NATO was short-sighted when it came when it came when it comes to Ukraine. So we are where we are, unfortunately, and we have to address uh, the issue the issue now. If we cannot be members of NATO together with all existing allies, we can build something like NATO around ourselves, countries who would specifically provide us with security guarantees. And I mentioned some of them, for example, uh, that they will provide Ukraine with all necessary weapons, which we need to defend ourselves. In case of an attack, they will on Ukraine. They will uh, seek the decision of the United Nations Security Council uh, against to stop this military aggression. There are many, many deep elements which we can continue to discuss at a professional level. But as I said, security guarantees are at the core of the discussion about the post-war settlement. And what about the EU summit last night? Was that statement enough that <clears throat> came out from EU leaders? Well, the European Union could have been more ambitious in its, uh, in its decisions, in its, in its uh, statement, but we know that this was an informal summit and we will continue working with the European Commission and the European Council on raising the level of their ambition and uh, uh, when it comes to Ukraine and Ukraine's uh, integration into the EU. I know that everyone is now looking at Ukraine through the prism of war, but the truth is that Ukraine is a powerful economy. It's a big country, big European country. And from all kinds of perspectives, the European Union needs European Ukraine and European Ukraine needs European Union. President Biden just wrapped up a speech about an hour ago, and he said Russia would pay a severe price if they used chemical weapons. Has the United States indicated to you any change of their stance if Russia were to escalate this in the use of chemical weapons? I can hear you. I, can, I heard the question about chemical weapons. Uh, well, well, President Biden said the... Russia would. Well, President Biden said Russia would pay a severe price for this, and I'm wondering if the U.S. has discussed this with you. Any indication that this is potentially a red line for Washington? Uh, I think the use of chemical or biological weapons is the red line for any civilized nation uh, of the world. And uh, yes, we uh, understand that President Putin did not achieve his strategic goals in Ukraine. He is, uh, to some extent, desperate. He wants to break us down, and we don't know what his limits are. His accusations against Ukraine um, about elaborating or about developing biological or chemical weapons are absolutely false. Uh, we have always been uh, a reli reliable and committed participant of all international regimes. He's just trying to change the balance in the, uh, in the perception of this conflict, because the whole world is now understands that Russia is an aggressor. Russia behaves in a barbarian way, uh, um, waging this war for 16 days in a row. And uh, the, he tries to change the perception. He tries to accuse us of being uh, of uh, developing nuclear bomb, chemical weapons, biological weapons, all kind of things. It's all yes. about Russian propaganda. But President Biden said Russia would pay a severe price, but didn't say what that price was. Has the U.S. indicated no. to you what that may be? No, no, no. We uh, we uh, haven't received any information from the United States about the price that Russia will pay 
if it uh, resorts to this measure. President Biden also announced more penalties towards Russia, getting rid of Russia's neutrality when it comes to or normal trade relations, also the banning of some goods. Last time we spoke, it was hours before the invasion, and you said the West needed to do more when it comes to sanctions. At this moment, there's been an onslaught of sanctions on the Russian economy. What more does Ukraine want the West to do when it comes to penalties? Well, first, it's in the interests uh, of the West, not only uh, Ukraine, to stop Russia, uh, because it destroys uh, not only my country, it also destroys the world order as we know it, and it also gives a bad example to those who want to follow the suit. So uh, these sanctions are imposed not only for the sake of Ukraine, but also for the sake of the world. And uh, uh, they, they are tough unprecedented, this is true, but as long as, uh, first, Russian soldiers are still in Ukraine and Russian bombs still fall on Ukrainian cities and kill civilians, and second, as long as some countries offer uh, bypass services to Russia to avoid the pressure of sanctions, we have to continue stepping up the sanctions pressure and uh, closing the loopholes in the, in the sanctions regime. This is the only way to make Putin pay a real price and stop his madness, uh, not only towards Ukraine, but also towards the West as a whole. The Ukrainian government has made even personal outreach to some executives about pulling back and halting their operations. At this moment, are there specific companies you're targeting? Uh, yes, unfortunately, there is still a list of, country, of companies who either uh, stay in the Russian market or announce the withdrawal, but in real terms, they continue to operate. And I would like to take this opportunity to send a very simple message to them. Stop making blood profits in Russia. Every dollar you make or euro you make in Russia is stained with Ukrainian blood. But aside of the moral part of the moral uh, ground of uh, making business with Russia, there are also practical considerations. You all see that Russian government is unpredictable in terms of making business and doing business in Russia. You all see that Russian economy is under sanctions and financial system is under pressure. So businesses, responsible businesses who care for themselves, for their profits, for their reputation, they should uh, be very careful when it comes to making business in Russia, not only because of moral responsibility and involvement in, the, uh, in financing the Russian war machine, but also because they may at any moment face the risk of being nationalized, of being restricted in conducting financial operations, on uh, feeling the pressure of the, of the government on taxation or any other issue. Russia is now one of the worst places to do business. And this is why I call on every company, every responsible company to withdraw. But as we speak, the assault continues. What, ca what really captured the hearts and minds of Americans this week was the shelling on that hospital in Mariupol that had a maternity ward. And still, the sanctions continue but the shelling also continues. Do you think the sanctions are actually working, Minister? If we didn't have sanctions, we would have had a much worse situation. Of course, President Putin will never uh, appear in front of the cameras and say, sanctions work, they inflict a lot of damage on us, and therefore we stop the war in Ukraine. This, this is not going to happen. But, um, he feels the pressure. He understands that uh, he uh, threw his country into a huge problem, and it mitigates, it has an impact on his decision-making. Yes, he did not stop the war now, but it would have been much, much more worse, uh, even worse than, than it is now, if we didn't have a strong, consolidated response, sanctions response from the United States, from G7, from the European Union. This is the real leverage that can stop Putin. The second leverage is the people of Ukraine who are fighting against him. 
uh, Minister, last time we spoke, uh, you really wanted the United States and European allies to de-swift a number of Russian banks. That has happened. What would be, you think, the one most important sanction the West can inflict on the Kremlin? Close all Western ports for Russian vessels and for foreign vessels trying to bring goods to Russia from those ports. Interrupt supply chains. Make, make Russia feel uh, full isolation from, uh, from international trade. This will have a huge impact, and this will uh, make the Russians put pressure on their government, on President Putin, to stop this mad and bloody war that no one except President Putin wants. Not just sanctions, there's also been a lot of debates, Minister, as you, of course, know about those fighter jets that Poland was willing to give to Ukraine. What is the status of those jets at this moment? Because it doesn't sound like the Pentagon here is willing to have them leave a U.S. military base in Germany. Well, we, we still don't have them. Uh, we see uh, an exchange of <clears throat> positions and announcements between Poland and the United States on this matter. While we continue to fight with uh, the planes uh, available to us, Ukrainian planes, it would be extremely helpful to get those planes either from uh, Poland, the United States, or any other third countries, because it would help us to uh, close the skies by our own means and save many, many human lives and many, many buildings from being, just, from being ruined uh, by Russian bombers. If we lose the sky, then... Uh, many lives will be lost and part of the responsibility for those lives uh, will be on those who did not provide ukraine with uh, all necessary weapons including the planes and are the talks continuing for those planes has anyone given you a timeline when you can maybe expect them Well, uh, I'm a diplomat, so uh, I do I do count, I do hope that uh, talks will result in uh, result uh, positive in, in positive achievements. Uh, however, I cannot I cannot give you any timeline on that. Uh, our position is simple: we need planes now because what Russia is doing in Ukraine now is exactly what it did in Syria. By controlling this, the airspace, they uh, co they cover uh, and back up their ground forces. They destroy civil infrastructure and race in cities to the ground, like uh, what is happening in Mariupol. It's uh, the biggest humanitarian catastrophe in the world now. Uh, so we need these planes now. Unfortunately, we don't have them. And I call on all governments who want to help Ukraine uh, prevail in this struggle and save human lives to provide Ukraine with uh, these planes. And can you give us an update as well as what is happening on the ground outside Kiev? That convoy, it seems like it's been dispersed. They've gone into forests. Are you concerned about a potential at a deeper attack into Kiev, given the fact that that convoy has, has pretty much disappeared, according to satellite images? Well, Ukrainian army helped to that convoy to disappear. Uh, we uh, helped many Russian convoys to disappear, to vanish. Uh, Today, uh, villagers uh, in eastern Ukraine captured a group of Russian soldiers who were walking towards the border, trying to leave Ukraine by, by, by feet uh, to escape the, the madness of this war. Um, the, the most difficult situation is in the south, in the south of Ukraine, where uh, Russian forces try to um, establish their control <clears throat> uh, over the Kherson region. It's the region bordering illegally occupied Crimea. And, of course, the city of Mariupol, the one that I mentioned, it's the biggest humanitarian tragedy in the world now, is besieged. Russia desperately wants to defeat it, uh, to capture it. We uh, defend it. Around, uh, I think, 300,000 people are locked up in the city. 
Every day we try to arrange a humanitarian corridor, a way out. Uh, every day it fails because Russia does not allow uh, uh, humanitarian corridors to operate. And uh, they're just raising the city to the ground. No food, no water, no medicine. Yesterday they bombed the maternity house in Mariupol where uh, pregnant women uh, were, were being treated. It's uh, it's a hell on earth. Uh, this is the most the most difficult situation on the ground as of now. Uh, yeah, and and minister, I can't tell you how heartbreaking those images have been to individuals in America. But the shelling is also moving west as well. How concerned are you about cities like Lviv that have also overnight? We have information that those cities also suffered bombings. Well, this is the problem of uh, of a control over the airspace. If we have if we have uh, enough of our own planes uh, and uh, anti and air defense systems, we will be able to take our own skies under control and protect our cities from being bombed from the air. This is what the, our aces, our pilots, are fighting fiercely and big and heroically in the skies, and we shoot down a lot of Russian planes. Uh, but the truth is that they also shoot down our planes. And uh, the numbers of our uh, Air Force potentials are incomparable. We have to literally refill our warehouses uh, to continue mm -hmm. fighting. If we, if we do not get the planes, then uh, our cities will be destroyed. And uh, this is exactly what Russia aims for. We even received one uh, uh, one piece of one, a piece of information that President Putin, speaking to one of the world leaders, uh, warned him uh, the, uh, against helping Ukraine with getting fighting planes. This mm -hmm. is an issue for him because he understands that control over skies is one is will make our life one much much more difficult. This is why it's not only again a moral thing to help us with the planes; it's also a purely military militarily important to to have to 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 supply us with those planes i would like to note one thing uh ukraine never asked any foreign army to fight for us we are a proud nation we never asked for boots on the ground but since we are fighting fighting against one of the largest armies in the world at least give us everything that we need including planes. We are not asking your pilots to fly. Give us the hardware. Give us the hardware that we will, that we will, uh, we will use to defend ourselves and to defend NATO. Because if Russia, theoretically, this is not going to happen, but theoretically, if they prevail in Ukraine, the uh, eastern, eastern flank of NATO will be the next, the next target. This is why it's in the interest of all to supply Ukraine with literally everything that we need, mm -hmm. because the future of Euro-Atlantic security is being decided here. Minister, I just want to end with what more do you think needs to be done? Because we've all seen these devastating, tra tragic and horrific pictures coming out of Ukraine. What more would need to be done for the West to uh, amplify this and send these fighter jets and even potentially have a no-fly zone? I don't know who are the people in the U.S. administration or in other foreign governments who advise against providing Ukraine with, with planes. But uh, uh, I would uh, encourage uh, you and uh, those who want to help Ukraine to identify those people and to convince them, to, to talk with them and to explain to them that this is, the, this is not the moment to, uh, you know, to, to sit and wait uh, and see how Ukraine is bleeding because it cannot defeat Russia in its own skies. This is, this, this is really about the lives of our civilians, our children, and our uh, our cities, we, our beautiful cities, which are being ruined now as we speak. The, one of the most absurd things about Russia is that, you know, President Putin, he always argued that he goes to Ukraine to defend Russian speakers. 
But the first cities that he started to bomb are mostly Russian, uh, uh, mostly residents of those cities, they speak Russian. Help us to protect, to defend ourselves and to defend the Euro-Atlantic security as a whole. Uh, I know the arguments of those who speak against uh, providing us with planes, and they are not convincing at all.